you for coming out today. We <laughs> sincerely appreciate it. My name is Max Hemelho. I'm Vice President of Marketing this year. Um, brief note before we get started, uh, keep your eyes open on your email. We're sending out a survey. We'd love to get your feedback on the event today, what you enjoyed, what you'd like to see done better in years to come. And we, uh, yeah, so we'll go ahead and get on with our panel. First job in sports. Should be a terrific panel moderated here by Ira Salberger, and uh, go ahead and let you take it away. Oh, thank you. Thank you. This is on. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm still uh, recovering from last night uh, with my fellow panelists here. Um, I will tell you, hitting Ricks and scorekeepers in the same evening is not recommended for the early morning panels, but for the afternoon panels, we're going to be fine. Um, my name is, uh, as he said, Ira Stahlberger. I run the talent marketing business at IMG. Um, we are also, I also work closely with uh, my Hollywood friends at WME, who recently purchased us. Um, so that means I really should be on the talent marketing panel down the hall, but I was kicked off that panel, and I was asked to moderate this panel. And the key word is moderate. So I'm not supposed to give a lot of comments. I'm just supposed to keep things going, um, which to some of you who know me, that might be kind of difficult. Um, but I thought we'd start off um, with something a little bit different, maybe a little exercise. So I'm going to put this down. I'm going to stand up. Literal exercise. Huh? Yeah. And, um, you know, when I want to do something that makes us all a little uncomfortable. And when you become uncomfortable, I think that's when you really grow. And that's when I think you really learn. And so I want everyone to take out your iPhones. I'm sure you all have them. And for the two engineers in here that have droids, you can take those out too. <laughs> I want everyone to uh, go to settings, if you could do that for me. Obviously, you guys have passcodes and stuff. And then I want you to find this little thing called airplane mode, and I want you to put it on. And I know there's some of you there supposed to be tweeting for the conference, and for those two of you, you can keep it off. But for everybody else, I want you to put in airplane mode. And the reason I ask you to do that is because it makes us a little uncomfortable when we're not glued to our device, at least as a talent agent. It makes me a little uncomfortable. In fact... A couple weeks ago, we were down in Florida at an off-site meeting, and there were 250 talent agents, and they made us do that. And you want to talk about 250 uncomfortable people without their cell phones? You should see us. So for 50 minutes or so, let's just focus on the guys that are here. So thank you for doing that. Appreciate it. Um, so we had, I thought this morning was fantastic. I thought even last night, as everything started out, was uh, unbelievable. We had a, a nice time with uh, Dave Brandon. And uh, it's a really a credit to everyone who has put this thing together over the last three years, and I'm just proud to be a part of it. Um, but this is not about me. Uh, this is about my fellow panelists. So it feels like it's about you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to stop. So uh, let me, instead of me introducing them, I will let them introduce themselves. And the great thing is I think this is the only panel of the day that Everyone up on this panel has one definite thing in common, is that we are all alums of the University of Michigan. So good, so good. Uh, I'm done, so go ahead, Seth. Uh, my name is Seth Jacobs. Uh, I work at uh, CAA, Creative Artists Agency, um, direct competitor with this man to my right. Um, I work in the corporate consulting division within CAA, CAA Sports, technically we sit within. Um, I've been there for, for two years now, and we um, are marketers, integrated marketers that focus on sports and entertainment. So we represent brands, um, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bose, um, Time Warner Cable, and a whole host of others in everything they do in sports and entertainment, um, what their strategy should be, what they should invest in, um, how they should negotiate, how they should use the assets they get. Um, how they should measure the assets and, and the programs that they run, um, and on and on. So that's me. Welcome, Seth. Thank you. Good to have you. Daniel, go ahead. I'm Daniel Shackney. I work for the National Basketball Association um, in the Global Marketing Partnerships Group. For been there almost five years now. The first three and a half, four years, I was really focused on the strategy of our sponsorship sales. So coming up with the ideas internally that we would go and pitch to the partners and prospects um, that we're trying to do business with. So things like the Sprite Slam Dunk Contest, things like that back in the day all originate with our group and we really work on kind of coming up with the next innovative idea to sell. Recently in the last year I switched over to business development and kind of am now on the front lines of selling, specifically focused on the NBA and USA Basketball. So two great properties of ours and have a chance to kind of work with 
a number of our partners to expand the deals they currently have, as well as find new partners in the key categories that we really want to make sure that we deliver against. My name is Erin Prober. I work for Premier Partnerships. We are a boutique uh, sports sales and consulting firm uh, headquartered in Los Angeles and New York. We represent uh, various properties, including sports teams, leagues, iconic destinations, facilities and events, uh, and secure naming rights and high-level sponsorships. I've been at Premier for three and a half years, uh, and I work on the marketing services side. So while we are predominantly a sales organization and sales-minded, uh, I'm not responsible for bringing sponsors to the table. Uh, rather, I work hand-in-hand -hand with the salespeople, uh, and similar to what Daniel did um, in her, his early days at the NBA, uh, I work on strategy development, platform development, uh, customization, packaging, uh, and, and also negotiating our sponsorship deals. Uh, my name is Ron Melnick. I work with IMG College, uh, with IMG, with IRA, uh, different division. I'm in the college division. So the way IRA and I work together, um, he calls me for asking me to do fashion, and I say no. Um, <laughs> but then when we, what was it, a few years ago, we, Michigan beat Florida in the Elite Eight. Elite Eight. We destroyed Florida in the Elite Eight, if you remember that. It wasn't six seconds after the game was ended that I get a text from Ira. Do you remember that text? I do, I do. Yeah. What, what did it say? I need tickets. For? Me. No. <laughs> the answer, no. The and answer my kid. The answer would have been no <laughs> for Kate Upton. <laughs> so that's how, that's how we work together. Um, uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm the moderator, so I'm not going to jump in. I'll just so, let that lie. <laughs> uh, every, everybody here familiar with the relationship between Michigan Athletics and IMG College? Raise your hands. Okay. So you there in the gray, sir, fourth row, can you explain that relationship? Uh, yes and no. Uh, that's a division of IMG College it's called CLC that handles the licensing. Who else can help out on terms of IMG College and the multimedia rights? There was a whole bunch of hands earlier. All right. So what we do, um, uh, you, uh, we handle the multimedia rights. So if there is a corporate brand out there that wishes to, wishes to align itself with Michigan Athletics, they do that through our team. I have Justin Norman here, who's, who's also part of the team, and Amanda used to be part of the team, now with national sales. So that, that's what we do. So we work with brands like Meyer and Cadillac, Apps of Pure Water, um, to create their marketing partnerships between them and, and, uh, and Michigan Athletics. Great. Ron is the Jim Delaney of our panel. He'll be taking most of the questions and answering them quickly. No, I was just kidding. You don't want to say something I'm going to finish. I wish it could be Jim Delaney. No, that was great, by the way. Anyway, that was all great. Listen, the, the great thing is that not only we have um, alums, obviously, all from the University of Michigan, uh, but also in varying degrees of their careers. Um, some relatively recently, like Daniel out of school. Um, some of us, like Ron and myself, a very, very long time ago, we were lucky enough to sit in those seats over there. Um, but let's start with the main those question. Seats did not exist. That's true. It's not nearly as <laughs> nice. Cool. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Ross. Um, let's start with the, the question of the day and the reason uh, we're all here. The question is how to get your first job in sports. And I think it is, uh, obviously, it's the ultimate question because that's, I think, when most of us are, are sitting here are wondering is how did we all get our first job in sports? 2008, and I, I had a couple of internships uh, in the sports management field. Um, similar to an event like this, I always took it upon myself to network with people and introduce myself, uh, follow up, and, and try and establish a personal relationship. Um, at the time, uh, there was a gentleman from Human Resources that came to speak uh, to one of our classes uh, about sponsorships, or it wasn't sponsorships, but just potential career opportunities um, at the Palace of Auburn Hills and the Detroit Pistons. And I kept in touch with him, and <coughs> graduation was upon us. Uh, I wrote him an email. I sent him my resume. 
And I graduated the one year that we didn't get to be in the big house because of the renovations. And I remember sitting on the Diag with my Blackberry at the time <laughs> at graduation, looking through my email and I got an email from him and he said, oh great, are you, are you applying for the marketing coordinator position in corporate partnerships? And I said, yes, yes I am. I'd love to do that. And a couple of days later, uh, I had a phone interview and went through a series of in-person interviews and experiential challenges uh, to complete the job and you know, was offered a job pretty shortly after that. That's great, that's great. Um, Daniel, obviously you're the most recent grad here. Yes, I and that uh, honor and distinction. I'm that's great, and you probably didn't have a BlackBerry, which is good. <laughs> For work uh, right? I did until this year, no, right. Samsung's a partner. We switched. That's good. That's good. Why don't you tell us your story, and I assume your first job is, was at the MBA, correct? Yeah, so I started at the MBA right out of school, but while in college, I um, was really closely involved with Sport Business Association, so I'm sure a number of you are as well. I was president of that club, and through that kind of made a number of connections that I leveraged into internships, one of them with the Pistons, with these two lovely people to my left. Um, also worked at Octagon and then Madison Square Garden because, for me, it was about creating a path to my passion, which was always basketball and working for the NBA. So I wanted to make sure that I had had experience relevant to that type of job. So worked for the Pistons in season to get the team experience and get a sense of what that was like to be part of that as well as then work for Madison Square Garden over the summer to really experience this bigger organization in New York um, to put it together and really make a number of connections surrounding the MBA that when I was ready to graduate, I was kind of able to, similarly to Erin, leverage and shot my resume around, emailed people. Um, the MBA has an internship program, associates program. Unfortunately, didn't get those, and I still like to tease the people at the MBA at this point that I think I've outlasted every member that they hired and said at the time, um, but kind of got in there in the ground floor as a project employee, which in sports I think has become pretty common, where I was working full time but being paid hourly as very much of a prove yourself ground, and did that for six months and really just did whatever I could to help out, network as much as I could within the company, and was fortunate enough to get hired uh, the day before our lockout hiring freeze. So just squeaked <laughs> in and just made it. Um, but I've now been there five years, and it's been great. That's great. Um, you know, some of us who have been working a little bit longer, uh, myself, I uh, actually started in the advertising business. I didn't actually start in the sports world right away. And we'll talk a little bit later about the different avenues and paths and sort of the, the sports ecosystem, if you will. Um, but, Ron, did you, how did you start out? Um, in the business, and obviously, you know, we don't go through the whole career path, but I think really how you started out, because I don't know if you started out right uh, <laughs> right out of school or not. It's going to be interesting, Ira. Um, <laughs> I didn't get involved in, I did, my first job in sports I didn't have until I was 29. So uh, right after school, Michigan, I went back to Canada and worked for a Fortune 100 company for four years and did a master's degree at Miami University and uh, down in Oxford. And... Um, I wanted to get in sports. I, I really liked sports, and I wanted to combine business and sports. My previous job that I had up in Canada was uh, with sales and sales management, um, and so I wanted to get my foot in the door. Uh, so I, uh, I was a bartender, and I'm a horrible bartender, <laughs> and the owner, the owner of the minor league hockey team, the Cincinnati Cyclones, comes in, I, I, I got to know him a little bit, and I said that he should hire me for, with his organization. So I said, sure, come on in, gave him my application, and he, he hired me to be a ticket salesperson. So I was 29 years old, I had a four-year degree from Michigan, I had four years of professional, or, or uh, four years of professional sales and management experience, and a master's degree from Miami University, and they paid me a whopping $12,000 a year to sell tickets for a minor league hockey team plus commissions. But when your biggest ticket is 12 bucks, you've got to sell <laughs> a bowl of You're killing tickets. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but I thought that if I could just get my foot in the door, um, I knew that if I, if I worked hard, that other opportunities would, uh, would present themselves to me. That's great. Um, let's uh, switch gears a little bit. Um, to answer the question. Huh? No, we're going to give you another question. It's okay. <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. So I think one of the things that, um, you know, there's a lot of people, we all know the sports world, 
Uh, the media world uh, is extremely competitive. Um, there's a lot of people that want to get into this business. Um, it's a great business. It's a challenging business. But at the end of the day, it's a really, really fun business. Um, and it's great to do something that you're passionate. I'm sure you guys hear that all the time. Um, but what things, Seth, set you, set you apart from some others um, when you were starting out? Um, I think pretty clearly my humor. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, I think you heard some consistent themes of, I think it sounds great to a lot of people to say, I love sports. I want to work in sports. That seems like a fun thing to do when I grow up. Um, it's very competitive. A lot of people want to do it. A lot of people are calling, submitting resumes, whatever. Um, so I think it's about the hunger and passion and following up and, trying everything you can from making contacts to connecting dots to who do you know that knows someone, all those types of things. So um, maybe not necessarily the, the first thing some of my friends from college or people that know me well would, would kind of consider me to be a very outgoing or um, aggressive person in general. Um, but when it came to this, I just knew that that was something if I wanted to get, and, and Ron used the term, you know, my foot in the door, that I need to do whatever it took to, to do it. I, I'm now going to answer the questions that, that Ira wouldn't let me answer. Um, when I was uh, at the University of Michigan, I was a sophomore. Um, I, had, I actually went to high school in Cleveland, crossed the border, made everyone upset, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, I, I knew some people who were at IMG um, that was based in Cleveland at the time. And uh, I actually applied for an internship to work at the Detroit Grand Prix up in Belle Isle. Um, during spring term of sophomore year. And so that's kind of how I even just got in the door and started to, to make connections and, and start my path. Everyone else that was on campus for spring term was taking one cinema class for an hour a week and drinking all day. And I was waking up at 5.30 in the morning and driving up to Detroit and working all night, pretty much coming back home, trying to have one beer with them and then falling asleep while they were partying all night. So, um, you know, it was just about kind of deciding that this was something I really wanted to do and making sure that I would do whatever it takes to kind of connect the dots and start to build a, a career for myself. So that's great. And I'm glad you answered that question. I didn't mean to leave you out. Um, so, you know, one of the things we talk about uh, when we're looking for candidates and how to get into the, the sports world is, um, you know, do you, how do you assess what you're good at? And I think that's, as, as everyone sits here today, I think that's one of the hardest things for everyone to do is to really – you know, there's, I don't know how many of you are in the MBA program or probably in the BBA program here. You know, they do these things called SWOT analysis, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and, threat, and threats. And, but strengths and weaknesses, um, I think it's really important for anyone when they're looking for a job, whether it's their first job or any job, is really to identify what you're good at. Daniel, I don't know, how did you go about um, identifying what you're good at and what you want to do and how you're going to leverage that to, to get your first job? I think it took a lot of time. I think, like you said, it's a really tough thing to do to train yourself to think that way and get a sense of what are your strengths and where are your areas for opportunity. Um, for me, there were certain things that just always stood out. I've always been really type A and organization-based, and there's good and bad with that, but a lot of it in the workplace ends up being really good in that I was really organized and kind of used that to my advantage early on to really get a sense of keeping track of all the networking opportunities that existed. And it sounds crazy now, but I remember freshman year starting a spreadsheet that was like all the people I had met in the industry through the years through like SBA events or this didn't exist, but conferences like this that you meet people in. And it ended up being such a benefit long term and something I was able to really take advantage of. Um, and then through the years, you also learn your areas of weakness. For me, I had to push myself a little bit to be more outgoing and that it wasn't in my personality at first to go up to someone at a conference or talk to them or just reach out via LinkedIn or whatever it might be. And that's something now that in my day-to-day -day job, I have to do on a regular basis in terms of establishing relationships and put some time into it, got tips from a lot of people that I recognize were really good at it, and then just trying to turn that into a strength to leverage moving forward. That's great. That's great. Um, Ron, I'm sure you don't have any weaknesses. But um, maybe some strengths. He said he's a terrible bartender. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> My special was Bud Light. <laughs> I, I, I would say, well, for, for me, I was completely overqualified for the job. Um, 
but just because of my background. But now what I look for, for pe from people when I'm hiring people, what I look for is, is um, you know, make a difference. Understand that you're in a very competitive situation. Somebody just like you, three people, you know, was in here to see me right before. Somebody just like you is coming in to see me right after. So how are you going to, um, how are you going to differentiate yourself? Um, uh, you want to come in, you, don't, you want to make it easy for me to hire you, okay? And, and uh, I'm an older conservative person, right? So men don't wear earrings. Okay? Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no earrings, guys. Take that away. Okay. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not, right? Because that, yeah. yeah. So um, uh, come on in and, and be able to, when I'm asking questions, uh, be able to answer them succinctly with some great storytelling and create a, create a, a relationship with me to, so that I can see that you'll be able to do that with other people out there. That's I mean, great. I mean, I think you... If you, if you listen a little bit to kind of what we all do, um, and this might not apply to every single job in sports, but, you know, a lot of it just comes down to, um, you know, building relationships, knowing how to handle different situations. Not everyone's going to have the same type of personality, the same approach, but what is your difference and how are you going to connect with um, the person you're talking to? You know, we all had to do that to get our jobs, but also every day when, 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 we're, when they're calling people to try to close deals, they're dealing with all different types of people that run different types of companies that are looking for different things that might have a lot of time, might have no interest, might have all sorts of different things. So it's, it's really important to be able to, to read the room, to know who you're talking to, to know who you're dealing with, and to bring the best of, of whatever makes you special or different to that conversation and to that person, I think. Yeah, I would agree. Um... You talked about focusing on your strengths and some do's and don'ts. Um, all of us, in a varying degrees, are all in positions to hire people. And, uh, you know, that, that thing, that sort of inflection point when we actually meet people is critical. And, uh, and honestly, we said, like you were talking, Daniel, about networking and meeting people even in the hallway at events like this. But it all really comes down to that interview. And the interview is, you know, that's your test. That's your chance to shine. And um, all of us have gone through many different interviews, and I think a lot of us, all of us, have probably interviewed a lot of different people. And I would love for all of us just to go through uh, the panel here and just kind of share some interview tips, maybe some interview watchouts. And we know Ron says no earrings, but everyone else, you know, I'd love to hear from you. Aaron, why don't you start? Sure. So I would say um, be bold, um, make yourself memorable, um, and do something. Um, that really makes an impression on the person that you're meeting. Come in prepared. Come in knowing about that per the person you're meeting with um, on a professional level and also on a personal level. Um, try and make it, make it a conversation. Um, as Ron said, people who are interviewing don't, don't want to ask questions and, and get a response and, and deal with a person in that format. That's not how business works, that's not what we do. It's about relationships, it's about storytelling, and it's about creating a really strong office culture also. So pay attention you know, to the culture and who you're interviewing with. If you're interviewing with me, I'm, I'm probably a little bit more different than you know, if, if you're coming in to interview with Ron and, and our office is in Santa Absolutely. Monica and on the beach. And you can wear earrings. We could, you could wear ear, right. mm, maybe not, maybe not. But it, it's a fun office environment, so it's it's different than if you're walking into the NBA and, and interviewing there. So don't wear earrings at the NBA, definitely. Yeah. Wow. I would, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would say that all of you in the room have have a certain leg up in that sense, and I think I've experienced it for sure. I'm sure you guys would all agree that being a University of Michigan grad goes a long way. There's a lot of us out there. There's a lot of us in the sports industry. And I'd say for the most part, we're pretty passionate about the University of Michigan. And that's an instant connection. That's an instant <laughs> thing to talk about and, and something to build off of when you're, when you're looking for that job or you're looking for, as, as Aaron pointed out, you know, what is it about the person that you can connect with or start a conversation or what have you? Yeah, I think that connection is really important. Like, to the extent that when we're interviewing people, especially people looking for their first job in sports, you really just want to know a few things about them. Like, one, 
Is it someone you can work with on a day-to-day -day basis? Is this like a good conversation? Um, and two, and really important, I think is just, is this someone that's dedicated to this? Like, is this someone that's gonna work hard and understand that starting out, they may have to put in a lot of hours or make sacrifices and work events at nights or whatever it might be. And I think it really is fairly simple in the first job in the interview that you just wanna get across those two things. So to the point that you can make those connections, use people you know, mutual friends, the Michigan network, whatever it might be, that's only gonna help you go even further and help you create those points of connection that are gonna last a whole career and help grow from there. Ron, you want to add anything? I've uh, uh, hired a lot of people and I've made a lot of hiring mistakes, I'm sure like all of us, and one of the things that I've, where I've made my mistakes is I've too often hired based on an amazing personality and too strong of a personality and too weak on the intelligence side. And I just thought that, that the relationship would, would, would carry everything. But what we do um, in terms of we are, we're, a, we're a sales office and we're a fulfillment office. And I don't know that I would hire from a sales perspective in terms of going out and talking to marketers um, from a brand perspective with Michigan. I'm not gonna hire anybody here who doesn't have significant sales experience. Um, now, we also have fulfillment people, and Amanda here and Justin, who probably went to the restroom, <laughs> you know, they didn't have jobs before, before we, we hired them. But I, I hired both of them because they were, one of the, they were smart. Like, they just, they came across as very intelligent, and they would be able to pick up our business and understand our business very, very quickly. And so that's what I'm looking for is how quick of a learning curve can, can, can somebody have and so that's what you want to be able to demonstrate because with many sports teams smaller sports teams or, or sports organizations there's no big training it's sort of day one you're into the fire um, many larger organizations fortune companies you know they're gonna put you send you somewhere to go f do four or six weeks of training before you're able to talk to anybody so I, I've intelligence is a big factor for me right? don't wear earrings and be smart <laughs> good <laughs> Not bad. Right. I'll start. <laughs> Shave. <laughs> Touche. Not at IMG. They don't care. My side of IMG, they don't care if you shave or wear earrings. So anyhow, um, you know, one of the things after the interview, I think there's, you know, we all live in a, in a connected world, and, you know, we all are, except for right now, because I made you shut your phones off for the, some of you that actually listen to that. Um, but how do you follow up? I think, um, you know, I, I, even to this day, are st I'm still really impressed with uh, people that we have come in an interview with us and how they follow up and the cadence of how they follow up. And I think it'd be very helpful for the audience uh, just to kind of hear, and maybe Daniel, since you were probably interviewing most recently, uh, maybe to start out just kind of how you follow up or don't follow up um, and what do you look for? Yeah, I think, I think it's just good to build that connection. So the extent that you can follow up to build a relationship and then specifically after the interview, I think it's nice follow up. I'm still a sucker for handwritten notes I don't know why, what it is. It's something that just takes it back to what it used to be. And everyone should send an email still. And I feel like within 24 hours, it's good to shoot that note off as a thank you. But it's this nice reminder a week later, a couple days later, whatever it is, when you do get a handwritten note that is thoughtful and has some really good insights into the interview and what went well. And I think that just shows me a second level of desire for the position. And it shows that you're really committed to this and you want to build a relationship. And I think to the extent that that job works out, great, but to the extent that it doesn't, really one of the big things about following up is continuing to stay in contact with the people you meet and creating that balance so that you get updates on enough. I think I talked to a number of Michigan students still being someone that is kind of recently graduated, or at least I like to pretend I am still on the spectrum of things. Um, it's nice when students do follow up every couple months, whatever it might be, just to give you an update, like just to make you feel that you're part of their education, part of their experience in the industry, it really establishes a lot of connections to the extent that then you can build on that later down the road. There's a number of Michigan students that we've hired as interns for the last three summers, and really all it's been is people that have continued to stay in contact with the MBA, with myself, that we were able to find a role for eventually. Yeah, that's great. You know, we, anyone else on the interviews? I think those yeah. are absolutely... I'll, I'll add one more. Um, I've taken it a step farther before, and... and 
Um, we now have a new employee um, who came from CAA who has done something similar. And um, along with sending a handwritten note, sending some kind of package um, to the person that interviewed you, if you have a unique name, um, sometimes you can play on, play on your name. It's just something to make you a little bit more memorable. Um, I think our, our intern um, found out, or he did this to get the interview with CAA, but he found out that the person he wanted to work for really loved a certain kind of macaroni and cheese or something like that. <laughs> so he sent him um, this macaroni and cheese with a note, and he got an email back from him um, instantly, came in for the interview, and, and got the job. Great. That's great. I'll give you one little story, because um, I'm not supposed to give my own stories here, but um, one of my friends runs sponsorships at UPS, and he had this great meeting, and he loved this kid, and he was so excited, and the kid followed up with uh, a thank you note, and he wanted to make sure he got there really fast, so he FedExed it to the guy at UPS. Don't FedEx to the guys at UPS. <laughs> That's just something everyone should be aware of, yeah. and vice versa. Don't UPS to FedEx guys. But anyway, the thought was there. The execution was terrible. Um, <laughs> anyhow, let's, uh, let's go a little more macro. I think we've given some really good examples on interviewing and networking and how we got our first jobs. Um, but as I touched on a little bit earlier, the sports world, and we all come at it a little bit differently. Um, Seth is on the consulting side. Um, obviously, Daniel's on the property side, Aaron's on the sales side, Ron's on the sales side, I'm on the talent side. Um, but the ecosystem of sports, and really when I was back in school, and I always wanted to be this Jerry Maguire type of person, but I really didn't understand the landscape of sports and how the, there's so many different entry points. And I think it would be extremely helpful for all of us to kind of talk from our perspectives, but also kind of explain you know, how the sports world really works and what it looks like. And Seth, if you want to start off. Yeah. You're getting close to that Jerry Maguire thing. Right? <laughs> um, so as I kind of touched on and as Ira mentioned, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, what I do for a living, I'm an integrated marketer. Um, just happen to be focused specifically on sports and entertainment, a lot on sponsorship, um, and, and really kind of, working for brands as an extension of their sponsorship team internally, like the guy at UPS as they're entering IMG College or any of their partnerships, they're, they're going to hire an agency to help them think about how they use that, how they should structure that, how they can get the most out of it, should they add talent into the mix, all sorts of things like that. So, um, you know, that, that's what we do and that's what I've done my whole career. Um, I started a little bit more in the event space, as I mentioned, the, the Detroit Grand Prix, um, which was a very helpful um, kind of foundation for what I do now to really understand what it takes um, for events to, to get put on, um, how difficult or easy it is to, to make certain things happen for a sponsor, um, and to really understand that, that side of the activation equation as I'm now more in kind of a strategic role of thinking about um, from a macro level what a brand should do and how it should connect to their brand message, their advertising, their media, all those types of things. Um, but, but one thing I was just going to say that um, I think is important and something that I didn't know and realize when, when I was in college and just starting out, um, I think all the other people on this panel are actually more technically in sales and in sales roles trying to get someone like me maybe to, to get my client to buy something from them. Um, and I never considered myself a, a salesperson. That's not my personality. I would never be good at sales. Um, but really, almost everything that, that you would probably end up doing in the sports world, you need to have somewhat of a sales mentality. You know, to, to build our business, we need to bring on more, more clients, uh, more brands um, that want to work with us on an ongoing basis. That's a sale get people to co continue working with us, that's a sale. Um, so it, it's important to think about what's going to make you stand out and, and what you can bring to the table and how different personalities can contribute to what you want to do, whether it's really more literally on the sales side or, or any part of the, of the sports world and ecosystem. There's nothing wrong with being in sales, <laughs> just so you know that. It's not a dirty word. Uh, something. <laughs> Daniel, well, how about you? Um, so for me, I've obviously been on the property side the entire time. So I think 
The interesting thing about it is the sports world has gone so big now that there are so many facets to it. I've kind of started in the property side, but ultimately see myself getting some experience in other pieces because I think that's part of being well-rounded in the industry these days. Um, but for me, the property is really interesting because it's one where it's this big event and it's this big brand and this big uh, sport all around the world that everyone kind of knows about. And it's something that I can talk to anyone about and it could be a personal conversation, it could be a professional conversation, it really is something interesting to be able to discuss. Um, and the property is a good thing to start off on, in my opinion, because it's something where you get a lot of experience on high profile events, specifically at some of the big leagues. Um, so you get used to that environment, what it's like to work those events, to working with a lot of people as well. So especially starting out out of school, there's just so many people at the NBA. I think we're like at 1,200 employees now, and that's just this giant network of people to like learn from and tap into. And I think the one thing that's a little limiting on the property side, especially start, is you're usually very focused on a certain role. So for me, it's always been the sponsorship space is kind of where I've started on. Um, but something that you get good experience in, and as long as you recognize that, you continue to figure out what are the other pieces of the industry that you think are most appealing. I, I similarly have always um, stayed on the uh, sponsorship side. Um, I've had three different jobs and three different unique experiences, which I think lends itself well to this question. Um, Daniel did a good job talking about specific uh, the property side. So my first job, I worked for a sports team um, doing fulfillment in, in corporate partnerships. And we owned uh, various number of properties beyond just the team, um, but I got you know, really good experience for two years, um, working under sales people that are selling directly for those properties that we owned and we control the rights to, and we internally could make those decisions fairly quickly. Uh, after that, I transitioned uh, to IMG College um, and worked on the Michigan property for a year. And while that's also on the sponsorship sales side, that model's a little bit different. It's an agency, um, but the agency, as Ron said, controls the rights for the university. So we still had to work with the university on clearance and, and work together very much in a partnership-oriented fashion. Um, we we're focused mostly on the University of Michigan ath Athletics, but just a different, uh, a different process of the sponsorship sales side. Now I work at Premier Partnerships, and again, we're a sales representation agency primarily, um, but our model is completely different. We work um, anywhere from, we can work with 10 to 12 to 15 properties at one time. Uh, our salespeople have the ability to cross sell at, at multiple properties. Um, our model is different though. We don't own the rights uh, to any of the events that we're working to secure. We have to work really hand in hand and, and be educated often about what we're selling. Um, when, we se when we secure naming rights or after our contract is ended for one or two years or however long it may be, we're done and we're out and we're on to the next, uh, next project. So it's, it's variable, it's always changing, um, and it's just, you know, it's a different model. You know, you're gonna... I can't remember the question. That's fine. <laughs> How about a new question for you? Um, so a couple more, and I think we want to open it up to questions from the audience, so hopefully you guys are all thinking of a few things in the last 15 minutes or so. Um, but, you know, we talk about in sports, you know, about obviously winning and losing and about having great success and great accomplishments, but also some disappointments. And I think it was Ben Sutton this morning that said uh, he's learned some of the, the best things um, in some of his greatest failures. And uh, I think it would be helpful because uh, I can, I think I speak for all of us, we've all made mistakes. We've all had situations that we wish would have turned out better and Ron maybe we'll start with you and maybe you want to talk about something that came worked out really well and or something that maybe was a disappointment. Jeez. Um, as it applies to these guys uh, and, and looking for a position, um, the, the mistakes that I made when I was trying to find a job was not being aggressive enough. Uh, was to think that if I call somebody one week, that that was enough. Um, uh, yeah, uh, people who are hiring, they, they get tons of phone calls. And, and um, I, I would say 
my suggestion to you in terms of if you can learn from my mistake would be to be much more aggressive in your, in your pursuit and in your follow-up uh, with uh, potential employers. So don't take no for no. <laughs> That's a good strategy in, in life and obviously in sales. And obviously getting your first job truly is a sales job, right, in itself. Aaron, do you want to? I think not, not a disappointment, but, but something um, that I continue to work on to this day is just um, to be a really good listener um, and know when it's your time to contribute and um, really think about what think about what you say and how you can contribute and if if your comment is relevant and make sure that you have the support you know with, when, with the people um, that are sitting next to you to to feel like when it's time you're able to make an impact convey your opinion um, and at the same time though don't be afraid to just go for it and say something I've been wrong, I'm still wrong, um, but you, it's how you learn, it's how you recover, so listen and, and sometimes just go for it and you can say I'm sorry, and do better next time. So it's a little bit of both. Um, one of my biggest mistakes and ended up definitely teaching me a lesson for a long term is between my junior and senior year at Michigan, I mentioned I interned at Madison Square Garden. And to build it up a little bit, for me, that was like a dream. So I'm born and raised in New York, lifelong New York Knicks fan. Like, that's been my team my whole life. So here I am. I go to their practice facility for my interview, walk in the locker room, like super cool experience. I'm still in college, not yet jaded a little bit by some of these things. Um, and I sit down for the interview, really excited for it. And the first thing the guy says is, so you're applying for a job at the New York Yankees. And I had in my cover letter not made the, all the changes I was supposed to. And they wrote New York Yankees in the cover letter. So I'm all excited. I could not have gone faster from like this level to like all the way down here just to start an interview. Um, remarkably, if you see Andrew Carson and David Rothstein there at the conference, two Michigan grads, they still hired me somehow. I, to this day, don't know how they would because I can say right now, if someone did that in an interview I was in, I would not even have considered hiring them or probably interviewing them. Um, but it was definitely a mistake I learned from. I don't think I've ever sent a cover letter or resume without reading it now at least probably 10 to 20 times to make sure I fixed everything. But it was a good mistake that I luckily had early on, was able to recover from it, and definitely taught me a good lesson moving forward. Great. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's actually a, a, a really interesting um, Story, <laughs> funny story. Um, I hate both of those teams, but we can get into that later. <laughs> um, the, Thank you, sir. The, the, uh, the world, I didn't have a BlackBerry when I was in college. I didn't uh, email my resume to anyone when I was trying to get a job. It's before those times, unfortunately. Um, but um, the world's getting more and more kind of real time, and there's so many different ways to follow up with someone, to communicate, to for even us to check up on you if we were thinking of hiring you and, and there's a there's a lot of potential danger there in terms of accidentally copying someone in an email that you didn't want to see that email or that you were talking about them on that email or social <laughs> media or, or lots of different things that um, not just kind of reading your cover letter or whatever 10 to 20 times but really being careful and and very conscious of before you send an email before you um, post something on social media before you maybe text someone if it's in the sports business related sense um, you know you can you can make some mistakes pretty easily and pretty quickly there I would say I know exactly what you're talking about no not last night but I've done that before right, too. I just want, I want to, because we were talking about this last night I wanted to mention that it's a really 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 small industry and everybody here knows everybody or knows somebody that knows that person so just be careful. I mean, real, your reputation is everything. You never know who you're going to work for again, who you might have to sell something to or call on again. Um, and just, just keep in mind to always put your best foot forward um, and, and just be careful in every situation because it's small and it might come back to you. <laughs> Very true. Very true. Very uh, I think we have about 10 more minutes or so. I think we'd love to open it up to questions. Um, 
Okay, there's a couple of us. Why don't we start in the front, and then we'll go in the back there. Hi. So I was wondering um, how, as employers, you would take somebody who is an applicant for a position who is of sort of a different background, say maybe didn't necessarily study business in college or sales, but maybe study art or um, music, but was very concentrated and worked very hard and did very well in that, but then decided, oh, but, you know, I do have this other interest, and I really – found that I like it, and they did outside things, they did internships and whatnot, um, instead of necessarily getting a certain degree, but really got, but really worked hard in something very specific. Uh, how do you, how do you view an applicant with that one background? I, I mean, I, my degree from University of Michigan was in English, I majored in English, so um, this program didn't exist when I was in school. Um, actually started in the kinesiology department, but but transferred out um, pretty quickly, um, actually. Um, so I think uh, it was probably harder when you're 29 and trying to do it than when it's tr you're trying to get your first job. I would say um, I, I don't I don't think from at least from my standpoint that that would necessarily be a negative as long as it was clear that the focus and the passion now is to try and get into whatever part of the sports world you're, you're interviewing in and why the skills you have or you've learned or you studied apply to, to kind of what you're applying for. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, again, like when you're trying to switch gears much later in your career or life, it's, it might be a different story. Um, and, you know, you had to take kind of a, a step back almost in terms of what level and how much money he was going to make and all that kind of stuff. But at least from my perspective, it at the entry level and at the kind of just getting into it stage, I don't think that would be a huge, a huge hurdle to overcome. Did you kick butt in the internships? Uh, well, I mean, in this, in this example. Oh, in this <laughs> hypothetical. In this hypothetical example. <laughs> did your friend? <laughs> All right, because if he did, if he did or she did, right, and let's say it's in a, a totally different industry, then you have that person call me you know, to speak on your behalf and say how great of a job you did with your internship, how dependable you were, how she wishes or he wishes that they could have hired you but they just couldn't, and how quickly you picked it up, I could care less what you studied. Yeah, that, you know, that's a great point. I mean, I was a history major. You were an English major. Dan Rules of Our Management. Okay, that one. I'm a bad example. Aaron and I don't count for this question. Ron, I don't, what were you? Economics. Economics. So obviously you can see it varying degrees clearly. Um, but I think also one of the things that at least we always look for, it's no different than a professional draft, like the NFL draft. You see, you hear about drafting the best athlete. It doesn't necessarily mean the best position player, unless we have a real specific need. But for most entry-level jobs, you want the best athlete. What I mean by athlete, though, is someone, as Ron said, smart and passionate and can communicate. I mean, I think Honestly, one of the, the best skill sets you, you have to have in any of these jobs, really any job at all, but especially in our business, which is very relationship-based, is being able to communicate. And that doesn't matter if you were an English major or a history major or a sports management major or an economics major. Um, You've got to be able to get your message across. So I don't look at that as a liability at all. Anyone else in the back? Yeah, I think without a doubt, A, there's always the desire to get people from a lot of different backgrounds because there's just so many roles at a property and at a league like the NBA. I think we're up to 32 different departments, and there's a number of them that basically fit whatever your background might be. There's some that are creative-focused, some that are heavily math-focused, that are like our strategic development group or our team, uh, team bow department, that they look for people specifically with a different type of background for those roles. Um, and in your particular case... Obviously, international is a huge part of our business. That's a huge piece of our goal is to make sure that our internship program reflects that, but also our employees as a whole. 
because we do have now 14 offices around the world and the goal is to continue to use that pipeline to get people in the ground that have been exposed to the sport or have a connection to the sport for a certain reason and to leverage that passion combined with the work they're able to do to really create a great finished product. Right. And you can send me a LinkedIn message after. We can talk. For, for China's sort of an important market for you, right? A little bit, a little sure. bit of a big market for us. We, we have a couple fans there. So we'll do one last question, and then we have um, two minutes, and I know I think everyone wants to give us one little parting piece of advice. So one last question, and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think the, just some of the panelists today, you saw a, a good example of, of all the different things and on this panel even as well. I mean, you, there's from, you know, running a league or a property um, to more sales jobs, media, advertising, talent representation, um, obviously digital and social and new apps and all that kind of stuff is, is an exploding area. I mean, the, it, it really, the... The world has expanded significantly when it comes to anything that, that really touches sports. I, mean, I agree. Uh, you know, where are you from? I'm sorry? What's your favorite team? All right, the Giants. So the largest, the largest department within the, with the, within the Giants is likely going to be, well, probably ticket sales. All right, ticket sales is going to be big. Sponsorship sales is going to be big, both on the sales and the fulfillment side. So yeah, I'll talk to people and they say, yeah, I want to get into sports marketing. And I'll get 25 different answers in terms of what sports marketing is. So when you go to a sports team, they got ticket sales, they got sponsorship sales, they have event sales. They're going to have, now they have, you know, social entertainment, as I call it, in terms of a department. They're going to have marketing in terms of the people that place their, place, place the advertising. But that's not going to be a real, real big department necessarily. But we're, you know, and, and you see it, right, in terms of all the NBA teams. That's where the people are. You know why? Because that's where the revenue is. Yeah, I think the industry has gotten so big at this point that it really is almost limitless. Like, it used to be okay to say, and this is a pet peeve of mine these days, it used to be okay to say you want to work in sports. That answer doesn't fly anymore. Like, you need to have a little bit of an understanding of what you want to do with sports because it has become so broad these days that you can work in all those types of sales groups. There's events groups, there's NBA TV, and there's all these entertainment groups, and really it's become this unlimited potential in terms of using sports and then finding a particular lens within the industry you want to specialize in that really makes a difference, but for you all makes a huge opportunity in that there's just even that many more positions that are becoming available in the broad range of spectrums of kind of roles. We also didn't really talk about um, corporate responsibility or social responsibility. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, philanthropic ties to sports, and I know it's important to Seth, and it's important for all of us when we're selling a sponsorship now, is everybody wants to have some kind of focus on what their brand is doing in the community to better the fan experience and to bring opportunities around the community or around the region or even across the country. Uh, and, and to make a difference. So there's so many opportunities on that side with organizations, with agencies, or with nonprofits even. Mm -hmm. So true. Um, hopefully this has been extremely helpful for you. We, I know, have all enjoyed being back here. Um, before we go, I think it'd be great real quickly, just like we did in the last panel, or Abe did in the last panel, uh, some parting uh, pieces of advice or wisdom. And uh, since Aaron asked nicely to go first, uh, let's start with Aaron and make it quick. We have about a, a minute and a half. So Ron was one of the first people I worked with in my first job in sports. And uh, I'll always remember that he told me, and I heard him tell a lot of people, that when someone asks you something, it's okay if you don't know the answer. You shouldn't make it up. You shouldn't stumble. And you should just say, I don't know, but I will find out. Yeah. And that's you should find out and communicate it accordingly to the person that asked you that question. Like but not knowing is okay. <laughs> That's good. Killer. Yeah. I would say, um, yeah. Huh? You're going to use that piece of advice? <laughs> I love that piece of advice. Um, yeah, not only 
uh, sales is not only, it, it's a, it's a skill set. You don't wake up one day and you're a great salesperson. Yeah, you need to develop those skills. And that whatever you do when you're interviewing, you are selling yourself. There's a course that's taught here in the Ross School of Business by Roger Olson, which is like a sales skill 101 that I would recommend everybody to take. Daniel? Um, I think the first thing I'd say is just be persistent. I think we've tried to all get that across, but it's really the onus is on you guys to establish those relationships, network as much as you can, um, and do what you can to pursue your passion and figure out what is that goal, what inspires you, why do you want to be in sports, and take the steps you need to and talk to the people you need to to really figure out how to make that work. Um, and then I always try to, I have my favorite quote, it's by my desk, but it's good, better, best, never let it rest until your good is better and your better is best. And keep pushing yourself to try to be the best you can be. I can't follow anything. <laughs> yeah, that's tough. But you're the English major, so you'll probably yeah. draft something quickly. Yeah, poetry. <laughs> I don't have any poetry or sayings or anything hanging by my desk. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I think there was a lot of consistently good advice and good stories in terms of you know, finding out what, what it is about you that's different, what your strengths are, making sure that you communicate it well. Um, I think it was a really important uh, piece about it's a very small industry. Everyone's connected in some way, shape, or form. And you also never know how things are going to come back around. The first, one of the first people I reached out to when I graduated thought I was going to maybe move to Chicago um, and contacted. He referred me to a person that I eventually got in it, my first internship with after college, and I still run into him at industry events, I won't say how many years later, a lot of years later now, and it, it is really important to think about who you're talking to, how you're presenting yourself, and keeping those connections going, because a lot of it does really come back together and can lead to a job you never thought you would want or would exist or, or whatever down the line. Great. I will uh, close with uh, one of my favorite quotes. Um, and we talked about it in the sales world. There's a thing called ABC, always be closing. But I actually think there's a build on that that's actually even a little better, and it's actually something all of us, and all of us I think, um, think about all the time. Instead of always be closing, always be curious. I think curiosity is one of the, the best traits that you can have, and especially in this business. It's read and devour information and become a subject matter expert and own stuff. You guys know more about the digital and social media space than I guarantee you everyone at my level inside IMG and WME. You are the experts. Own that, be curious about it, and you will have a great career in the world of sports. Thank you.